Let's do it. Five seconds to go in the first half. Dante fires deep to the left. Moss caught it at the 11, but now he pulls oh, it. Oh, this! To Mo oh, Williams! Touchdown! You gotta be kidding me! All right, and welcome back to another episode of the Climb in the Pocket podcast. I am your host, Jason Brown. You can find me on Twitter at Brown Jason. And the streak is over, but for, for fret not, we still got, you know, QB1 and QB2 with me here this evening. Help me break down this upcoming playoff matchup, Vikings versus Eagles. JR, my man, how are things going? You've been a busy man this week, you know, how are things? Yeah, man, everything's good. I made it out of Eagles territory safely, so I'm good to go and fired up another day closer to game day. So let's do it. I'm ready. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Playoffs, playoffs, playoffs. And Saxy Prince, how are you doing, my man? I know that you, uh, I mean, I feel like you gave yourself maybe a day and then, you know, jumped right into this Eagles matchup. So, you know, how are you feeling? I'm good. You know, it was a... Uh, um... Yeah, it was. You obviously were coming off that high of that that game and stuff, you know. But once once Tuesday, um, Tuesday hit, I was really like, you know, I really need to start looking at Eagles for breaking stuff down, looking at their film. Um, so yeah, and I and I kind of wanted to try to take the um, the the attitude that I know that uh you know Mike Zimmer you know cultured team would. So you know, it's great to celebrate, and um, that was a fantastic win on Sunday. But then. You know, try to get right back into, you know, we still have two more games to win, you know, and two uh, two more games that we still need to win. So, um, yeah, man, it's it's been good other than that. All right. All right. Well, uh, I guess you and Don were putting in some of that extra work at practice, you know, you know, putting in some getting some suicides in, spend a little bit of extra time in the weight room, making sure that you're ready for game day. So I understand, you know, you got to get right on to Philadelphia. Body is sore. <laughs> get right to it. So. JR, like you said, you've been doing some work going into uh, the Eagles country, you know, providing a Vikings perspective, um, you know, breaking down this matchup, really, you know, letting the folks know what you're seeing when you look at film and what you're, you're thinking about this matchup. So I guess from a overall game perspective, I guess, what are you thinking? What are you seeing? And where do you think this game might turn, I guess, either for the Vikings or for the Eagles as things kind of play out? Yeah, so it's a very, very even matchup as far as personnel and how each team matches up. Talent-wise, the Eagles have a lot of talent on both sides of the ball, specifically, you know, in the backfield and in the trenches, in their offensive line and defensive line. That seems to be the bright spot on their team. And we all know where the talent is on the Vikings team. And it's in similar spots, you know, especially on the defensive line and out wide at wide receiver and in the defensive backfield. So I think it's two very evenly matched teams. As far as the Eagles offense, we know they have very explosive players on the perimeter and Torrey Smith, and we all know what Alshon Jeffrey is capable of. Um, during his Bears days, we knew he ate Xavier Rhodes alive year in and year out. It was one of the receivers that Xavier struggled with the most, and we were really glad to see him leave the NFC North when he did go to the Eagles. But Alshon Jeffrey, is, you know, he's a fantastic player. Um, production hasn't been as great. Um, probably because they focus so much on the running game and they have other weapons as well. Nelson Aguilar in the slot is another fantastic weapon that they do have. He's had a bounce back year this year after struggling his first few years in the league. Um, their backfield is very talented, as I said, with the three-headed monster in LeGarrette Blunt, Ajayi and Corey Clement. Um, all those guys do a great job when they do touch the ball. Um, and we all know it, it comes back to Nick Foles. That's the guy that their offense is centered around. That's who they built their game plan around in Atlanta, surprisingly. And I thought Doug Peterson did a really good job of not putting the game on Nick Foles' shoulders. And he wanted to be a run-first offense simply because you can't put the game in Nick Foles', Nick Foles' hands or, I mean, he's going to destroy the game for you. That's just how Nick Foles is. He's not a guy you can build your game plan totally around. And you can't leave the game in his hands because he's not that type of quarterback that he can put you on his shoulders and win a game. But what they did was they established a run first attitude and a run first mentality against the Falcons. And they put in some dink and dunk passes for foes where he could just manage the game and where they could play really tough defense. And that's one area where I think the Eagles are fantastic at. And that's their defense. Their defense is supremely talented, especially 
on the defensive line, they have guys like Fletcher Cox, who is a standout on the defense, and Brandon Graham. Those are two top guys on the defensive line. Timmy Jernigan is a great player. Um, shout out to Florida State. <laughs> uh, Vinny Curry, who's another good player, and the first-round draft pick this year, and Derek Barnett and Chris Long is another depth piece on their defensive line. So their defensive line is supremely talented. We all know the Vikings' offensive line has been shuffling a lot here lately, moving Mike Rimmers to guard and – so playing or leaving Rashad Hill at right tackle. So they want to get their best five guys on the field. Um, linebacker is a bit of a weak spot for them. If there is one spot that is really weak, it is their linebackers in the middle with Danielle Ellerby and Nigel Bradham. Uh, Michael Kendricks does rotate in and out with Bradham from time to time. At that Sam and Will linebacker spot, depending on what type of personnel package that they are in. Um, quarterback, a cornerback, excuse me, is a bit of a weak spot. Um, Jalen Mills specifically, I think he's the worst of the bunch in him, Patrick Robinson and Ronald Darby. Um, Mills and Darby are the two starters um, for or they take a majority of the snaps. Rasul Douglas and Sidney Jones do rotate in every now and then, but Mills and Darby do take a majority of the reps. I think their safeties are fantastic. And Rodney McLeod and Malcolm Jenkins. Malcolm Jenkins is like the Harrison set. He's really what, what makes everything go in. Really, the defense is predicated around what Fletcher Cox and Malcolm Jenkins are able to do. So there's a lot of fantastic and intriguing matchups in this game. But the one matchup that I will be keying in on is Brandon Graham against Rashad Hill. I think that's an outstanding matchup. And Brandon Graham really gave the Falcons fits in the run game and as a pass rusher. And we saw what Cam Jordan did to Rashad Hill last week. So. That's just scare Vikings fans a little bit. And I think what the Vikings are going to have to do is they're going to have to get into some condensed sets with David Morgan and Cal Rudolph on the hip of Rashad Hill, just so to make Brandon Graham's rush path a little wider. And also they can use Jarek McKinnon and Latavius Murray to help chip Brandon Graham when he's coming off the edge very fast. So the most intriguing matchup, I think, is the Eagles defense against the Vikings offense. On the flip side of that, I think, the other matchup is very intriguing as well, but I think these two teams are dead even as far as a personnel standpoint. One thing I want to point out before I get Yanka to hop in here and give his uh, his perspective on this matchup is that it sounded right there like you were comparing uh, Malcolm Jenkins to Harrison Smith, and the internet saved you from blaspheming because your connection broke up right when you said Harrison Smith and came right back in for everything else you were saying. So the only part that was cut out <laughs> was Harrison Smith because the universe didn't even Google Hangouts didn't even want you to blaspheme against, you know, <laughs> Dirty Harry like that. It just stopped it from happening to to, to save you from, you know, the, the troubles that would come from uh, from such blatant disrespect to the uh, the greatest safety in the history of safeties. <laughs> well, what I mean by that is he's the guy, he's the captain of their defense and he's what their defense is built around as well as Fletcher Cox. So I think he's the catalyst of their defense just using that analogy and that comparison for the two defense. Yep. That's fair. That's fair. You know, I got to give you a hard time every now and again, but Saxy Prince, man, I know, like we said, you know, you're a bit of a football junkie when it comes to these things and you've been, you know, putting in that extra time, staying in the film room late, really getting to it, you know? Yeah, man. So what are you seeing, man? What, what matchups do you think can be exploited for both teams? Yeah, I, I think JR kind of hit the, the nail on the head. It's going to be really, really exciting to see uh, the the Eagles, you know, offense versus the Vikings defense. You know, when I was kind of looking, you know, doing some film study, also looking at, you know, the pro football focus and whatnot, like the Eagles offensive line is actually really, really good. And I think this is this is probably one of the best offensive lines that we have faced in in a long time. Someone that like an offensive line that if you basically from uh, – from Kelsey all the way to uh, Peters, they like they're pretty st- <laughs> they're they're pretty stacked. Like a lot of their guys grade 85, 90, uh, 90 at Pro Football Focus. So, you know that that is going to be a tough challenge for us to try to you know try to create some pressure on that on that right side. Um, but I do think with facing Bite, I think that's something that Everson Griffin can really take advantage of. He can, um, you know, maybe cause cause a little bit of uh, you know frustration for Wentz. Uh, once it's pretty athletic, so I, you know, I don't obviously want, um, you know, Zim to kind of squeeze in the pocket a little bit too much and let him get outside, you know, maybe make a play or just get a scramble because he's a little bit athletic. Did you just say um, Wentz? 
Yes, man. I said Wentz. Okay, I'll just you know, no, no, no Wentz. Did. Sorry, I said Wentz. I, <laughs> okay, I did say right. I say Wentz. I, I'm we'll still give you yeah. an opportunity to correct the record. Uh, Nick Nick Foles. Um, so I mean, he, he you haven't seen it a, a, a lot, but you know, I I am still you. You just still have to worry about you know Nick Foles being able to you know scramble get outside the pocket. Um, so it, it is going to be a really exciting matchup to see how our D line uh, matches up against that offensive line. We, like I said, we haven't seen a, we, we just haven't seen us like really face, uh, I think this good of a defense in, 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 in a while. So, um, as far as kind of like the, where we can start to exploit, like I said, I think we can get, get after that left side a little bit more, um, on the other side of the ball offense versus their defense. Uh, Jr. touched on it. I think uh, LRB is going to be, um, you know, Jr. had said he like he is he has been a little bit of a, a liability because he's been mostly out of position. Um, so that that really that middle is going to be uh, a place where you can attack. You know, you, may, you might see some you know, drags that we might run, get Stefan Diggs, you know, really behind the linebacking core and see what he can do. Um, I, I definitely want to see if we can get you know Elf line to the to the that that second level. Um, that should provide maybe a little bit more running room, but at the same time, you know, I don't really want us running right into the teeth of that uh, that defensive line, of the Eagles. Um, you, you just have like the defensive line is just scary. I mean, it's almost if not as scary, it's almost as scary as our as our defensive line. So um, it, it is going to be trench warfare, in my opinion, on Sunday. And I think that's going to be key to see who who breaks first. Um, and yeah, I think you guys saw the tweet that I put out a little bit earlier this week. I said like, "Hey, I'm really worried about Nelson Aguilar. You know, he's he put him in the slot, and you know, we've had some um, some issues with the slot. I think Mackenzie Alexander has been playing very, very, very well. But um, you know, against Nelson Aguilar, this, I think it's going to be a little bit of a different beast. So I I would expect um, you know Foles to attack." attack that early and often, especially if they're rotating in with Terrence Newman, who's, you know, technically very sound, but obviously he doesn't have the speed of a Nelson Aguilar. So um, I would not be surprised if I see that, you know, be, get, see that attacked enough where, you know, you might have to, you know, you might have to uh, rotate the defense towards that a little bit more. But uh, I think it's, I think other than that, I think we, we match up very well to them. You know, Xavier Rhodes on, on a, uh, uh, have Trey Waynes on Tory Smith and then, you know, whatever happens in the slot, but it, I think it's going to be, you know, kind of a push. So you're really looking at this, who breaks first in the trenches. Okay. Okay. And, you know, before the last matchup, we were talking a little bit. And one of the things that, you know, I, I'd mentioned is I, you know, I kind of hope that they put uh, Lattimore on, on Thielen so that, you know, our man Diggs could, could get loose and do his thing. JR, as you uh, start to look at this matchup, I guess, what are you really hoping to see? Like, what do you think would be best case scenario if you were game planning on the Vikings part? Um, if you were looking for something that you could exploit or really attack on uh, the Eagles defense? Well, from a Vikings perspective, if I was game planning against the Vikings, I would run a lot of man beater routes. And from a running game standpoint, I would try to establish the run as much as I can. And even though you're not getting positive yardage initially, I think what you have to do, you have to stick with it. And a perfect game plan that was ran against the Vikings this year was the Panthers. What you saw with them was they ran a lot of crossing routes, a lot of rub routes, a lot of man beating routes, and they stuck to their power running game. And I think in order to beat the Vikings, you have to have a strong interior offensive line. And that's what we see that the Eagles do have. Um, they have a fantastic center in Jason Kelsey. Um, Steve Wisniewski is a, definitely a good piece for them that they did pick up. And Brandon Brooks has been a great addition for them since coming over from the Texans. So they have a really good offensive line outside of Big V on the left tackle spot. I don't want to butcher his name, so I just call him Big V. <laughs> um, outside of that, <laughs> outside of that, um, Lane Johnson, we all know he's an elite tackle as well. So they have a really good offensive line. Obviously, they don't have a Cam Newton type of quarterback that can run and add that extra element to the running game, but I think with Ajayi, Clement, and LeGarrette Blunt, I think having that three-headed monster in the backfield and them consistently trying to establish the run 
against the Vikings and stretching them horizontally as well as vertically or trying to run the ball up the middle. I think that's really a good game plan against the Vikings and how you can defeat them and get yardage on the Vikings. On the flip side of that, the Eagles, the one guy that I keep coming back to, and the Raiders did a good job of this, you got to attack Jalen Mills. I think that's the weakness in their defense. I think Jalen Mills is – I think he's going to be a very good player eventually. And he's gotten better ever since the playoffs have started and during the latter half of the season. But he really struggles in man coverage. And what the Eagles try to do, they use Darby as the boundary corner when they play man-to-man. So he's always the corner in the boundary. And they try to hide Jalen Mills to the field. So what they're saying is a lot of quarterbacks don't make a lot of throws to the field in the NFL. And so the way they counteract to that is they try to hide Jalen Mills to the field. And what the Raiders did is they started lining Amari Cooper up to the field when they were in the boundary. And they started running double moves right at Jalen Mills because he's known to be very aggressive when teams try to run those quick game concepts to him. So they're running a lot of double moves to defeat Jalen Mills because he's very aggressive. And I think what I would like to see the Vikings do is try to interchange Thielen and Diggs, depending on how they do play or match up against them to the field. And I would like to see Keenum being able to consistently make some quick throws to the field and get Jalen Mills to come up and be aggressive or be aggressive. And once they establish that, we all know Pat Shermer is really good at calling or timing those calls, running those double moves to Stefan Diggs, especially he did it last game against the Saints early on in the game where he got the penalty against Ken Crawley. So I would attack Jalen Mills. That would be my game plan all day long. Just real quick correction, because I, I heard you say it. I think I said Jason Peters, and I meant Lane Johnson. So appreciate the, the fix on that one. <laughs> I, yeah, my bad. They get it together, bro. Also, I bad for not catching it and, and uh, correcting you earlier. But, uh, but Saxy Prince, you know, see if you can get yeah. you back on track here with some takes with for players who are currently playing for the Eagles. And also for the Vikings. Yes, yes. Um, <laughs> like, who, who are the players you're looking at in, in this game? Who do you think might be a, a player who comes you know, out of nowhere to, to take over this game? Or do you think it's going to be kind of the usual suspects on either side of the ball that are, are, are the names we're talking about after this game's over? Yeah, I think I, I, I do actually do really think it's probably going to be uh, a lot of the usual suspects. I mean, J.H.I., is, he is going to have um, – I don't think he's going to have a great game. But I think that um, problems, I mean, he is a little bit quicker, a little bit shiftier. So, they, you know, they might find some ways to get him, you know, out of the backfield, you know, passes or whatnot. Um, but, uh, you know, formations go, they have re- two really good uh, tight ends, you know, Zach Ertz and Brent Selleck. So I would not be surprised if I see a lot more, you know, two tight end sets um, to really kind of take a t- take advantage of, you know, some mismatches that are there. Um, so. I guess besides that, you know, I think I think it may be just be like, you know, usual suspects. You know, they're going to try to they're trying to get the ball to Alshon Jeffrey. You know, they'll try to get the ball to, you know, Torrey Smith a little bit downfield. Um, but, you know, they're probably really going to work that slot with uh, Nelson Aguilar. Um, the, as far as a weakness goes, it's probably one of the weakest part um, parts of the Vikings. Um, I think. Also, if they can find ways to maybe get Anthony Barr into coverage, I think I've been seeing him, you know, closer to the line of scrimmage a lot more so. But if they can find ways to get Anthony Barr into coverage, I know he's he's been a little bit better in coverage this year than he was last year, but um, it's still not you know, a lot of his forte. If they can find a way to get him into coverage, I think that that's another matchup that you can exploit if I'm thinking about how to beat the Vikings. But... Um, other than that, yeah, I think I, I think it's just going to be our best players versus their play, best players, and you know who can who can come up on top. Well, all right. Well, you know what's coming next. You know, you guys give me quite a bit of analysis here, and you know a lot of you know outlying things in terms of how you think this game might go. But I need it. I need I need it right now, and we're gonna start with Prince. So you know. What is your bold prediction? What is your score prediction, Yinka? Yeah, I'm actually feeling I'm feeling pretty good about this game. I I was a lot more nervous this time around last last week. So, um, as far as score prediction, I think it's going to be a lower scoring game. I think it's going to be fairly tight, uh, maybe to the tune of sixteen thirteen Vikings. 
Um, I think – I'm not sure if this is going – I don't think there are going to be any – there's going to be zero receiving touchdowns in this game, um, and it's all going to be running backs and special teams if there's any scores. Of course he showed love to the running backs. I mean, always. I got him, oh, man. Always. Got him. <laughs> okay. All right. JR, man, how about you? Yeah, I'm with Nika. I think – I think it's going to be a defensive battle. Um, I'm feeling good about this game. I think the Vikings match up very well. The battle tested on the road. The one thing that does scare me is the defense gives up a little bit more points on the grass than they do on the turf. But they've shown to overcome adversity when they do play on the grass. We've seen it in London against the Browns. They faced some early adversity there before ending up distancing themselves in that game from the Browns. And the Washington Redskins was the other game that come to mind. They actually proved to win a shootout. So they were able to outscore another team on the road on grass as well. So I think 20 points is the magic number for the Vikings to win this game. I don't think Nick Foles can put up 20 points against this defense. So I'm going to go Vikings 23. I'm going to go Eagles 17. Bold prediction. I think Trey Waynes gets a defensive touchdown in this game, a pick six. Man, I like that. All right, let's I like see. That too. Let's see. Let's see. Let's see. Hmm, I'm gonna think for a bold prediction for me. I'm gonna go with uh, kind of in line with everything you guys were saying. Like the Eagles' defense is a very good defense. Um, it's gonna be tough to to sustain drives against them. But I think that for the Vikings, they're gonna turn the tables on what almost cost them the game. Last week, and special teams is going to come up really big for the Vikings in this game. Feeling that uh, one at least one of the touchdowns the Vikings gets uh, get in this game will be a, a return on special teams. And my score prediction for this game is going to be 24-17 Vikings. So that's where it's at. Our special teams, our special teams is going to have to come through for Jason one of these times because he's yeah, I mean, been, they got he's to. been predicting they got, well, I mean, special it, teams touchdown well, it, it for was a while. Special team, well, it was special teams, and then it was like defensive touchdown. You know, it's, it's it's one of them. You know, I need somebody who's not uh, Case Keenum or Latavius Murray or Stefan Diggs or you know all them to score a touchdown in this game. Uh, yeah, please hold while we retrieve our guest. Thank you. All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. And uh, we are very happy to have a special guest with us here on the Climbing the Pocket podcast. We have Michael Kist. Michael, how you doing? I'm doing quite well. Thanks for having me on, fellas. Hey, man, we're glad to have you. And uh, we'll get things started for you here. Uh, start you off with an easy question, a little softball here. Guess, tell us a little bit about yourself, where we can find your work, and I guess how long you've been covering the Eagles. You can find me on Twitter at Michael Kist NFL. You can find my XML work at InsideThePylon.com. I do draft and fantasy work for BreakingFootball.com as well. A lot of my work now, of course, is on LockedOnEagles.com, gearing up for this championship game. Got a lot of film pieces, got a lot of valuation pieces, uh, some stuff that I was able to do for Scouting Academy over the summer. So I, I've been able to repurpose some of those scouting reports for some of these games which is awesome so a lot of work on there um i've been covering the eagles in this capacity since august since i took over as the locked on eagles host you can follow that account at locked on eagles um john ledyard good friend uh he recommended me after i came on his locked on nfl draft podcast and uh hopefully i did well enough because i guess he, he recommended me for the spot to get on in that network and since then uh once i got on my first overall pick was Benjamin Solak. He works for NDTScouting.com, does a lot of great draft work. And, uh, yeah, since then, man, it's been, you know, <laughs> all Eagles every day, daily content, all that good stuff. And I've, it's been a blast. It's been a great season uh, to cover the Eagles it, to this extent. Well, that's awesome. And, and you know, one thing that I, I, I know about, you know, people who, who generally who are either from Philadelphia or have, you know, connections to Philadelphia – they don't tend to lack for for confidence. I guess the <laughs> Eagles season that that you know we we've witnessed this year was this something that you expected going in, or was this a surprise to you? You know, I thought we might be a outside chance wild card team. 
I didn't think that we would have the best record in the NFL. If I did, I, I would be a liar. And there's audio proof of me not saying that. So I would definitely be lying. But yeah, uh, a second year quarterback, you really don't know what you're going to get. He had Carson Wentz had his ups and downs. Uh, Peterson has had his ups and downs as a play caller. There were worries about him abandoning the run at times when they were down in games. And, you know, his creativity this year has really shown through his play calling. Uh, his aggressiveness on fourth down has put us in a lot of plus situations and hasn't really hurt us all year as well. So uh, I, I couldn't tell you that I saw this coming at all. We still had questions about Wentz. We still had questions about Peterson. And uh, the defense has really come together, especially at home uh, for us. And our road woes that we had last season have gone away, too. So there's, there were a lot of problems fixed really, really quick. And we're just riding that wave, man. It's been awesome. Mike Jr. here. Thanks for coming on once again. Um, we talk about the matchup with Mike Zimmer and Doug Peterson, two very well-respected coaches in the profession. Doug Peterson, more of an upper cumber at this point. Mike Zimmer has a little bit longer tenure than Peterson does at this point. But Peterson has definitely proven his worth, especially on the offensive side of the ball. So what's some intriguing matchups that you're looking or some schematic things that you're looking forward to seeing that Peterson or even Jim Schwartz does against Mike Zimmer and Pat Sherman as well? It's going to be an interesting battle for me up front and in the red zone. Up front, what I would like to see, because Linval Joseph, as we all know, is an absolute beast of a human being, and he can wreck a running game. And with the Eagles, with their starter as Carson Wentz from week one through 14, on first down, we averaged five yards a carry. Since Foles has started for us, it's been just over two yards per carry. We had eight runs of zero yards or less against the Falcons last week and only averaged 2.37 yards per carry on first down. We put Foles in some bad situations, man. And we were it would, some of those drives stalled out because of that. To get the run game going, even w in the face of Linval Joseph, uh, the Eagles run trap or wham more than any other team in the NFL. And when they do it, they average 6.5 yards per carry. I would much rather not block Linval Joseph and use him against himself then try to double team him and then have Kelsey or one of the guards climb up to the second level as Linval Joseph is holding on to them for dear life as long as he can. I would much rather not block him, get him upfield, trap him, and get get downfield with these with these running backs that, according to PFF, are third and fourth with Blunt and Ajayi at breaking tackles and making things happen. So that's one thing that's intriguing for me in the red zone. You know, the Falcons gave a lot of attention to Zach Ertz in the red zone last week, getting Nelson Aguilar in a plus matchup, uh, getting Trey Burton on a linebacker or another safety not named Harrison Smith uh, would also be a good thing as well. So those are the things that I'll be looking for as far as schematically on offense for us. Defensively, you know, you're going to have to deal with some of the exotic blitz blitzes that the uh, that the Vikings have started to implement with Harrison Smith, Eric Kendricks, Anthony Barr, so on and so forth. And you're going to have to protect Vitae on the left side with Everson Griffin, whether that be via condensed set, you know, hard counts to try to get him to jump. Because as you pointed out on Locked On Eagles, he likes to snap jump. So that'll be something we use against him. We use it against Von Miller successfully to get two offsides calls on him. So that those little battles really, really excite me. Michael Yinka here. Thank you for uh, for being on. Uh, once the season started, we kind of all knew that the, uh, the NFC Championship was going to be a battle between the Case Keenum and Nick Foles, obviously. <laughs> yeah. um, what, are, you know, what are your thoughts on uh, Case Keenum? Well, you know, what's the general atmosphere around him as well as, you know, how does he stack up against Nick Foles? Uh, as far as stacking up against Nick Foles, I mean, that's that's a real high bar you're setting because you're talking about a Pro Bowl MVP there in Nick Foles. But no, really, uh, Case Keenum, to me, extremely efficient this year. He's completing 68% of his passes. And uh, but at the same time, there's something about him, man, that I think that the Eagles will be able to bait him into some bad throws if they take away the underneath stuff and the, and the rush starts getting there. The thing about Case Keenum is, you know, he's a top five pressure quarterback, but he also avoids sack at the second highest rate when he's pressured as well. So he's very good at moving around the pocket, getting away from pressure. And then you've got McKinnon, who has 51 catches on the year uh, that you get him in the open field. He's shifty. He can make people miss and extend drives uh, with Keenum that the narrative around him is so interesting because I know a lot of Vikings fans love Teddy Bridgewater. And so do I, I think he's a fantastic quarterback and it's a tragic thing that happened to him. I was very upset when it happened because I'm a big Bridgewater guy. Uh, but with Keenum at the end of the third quarter against the saints throws that interception to Marcus Williams. And the only thing that changes that narrative that switches that narrative around with a total 180 was that 61 yard pass to Steven Diggs, uh, where Marcus Williams 
missed that tackle. So there is some things to like about Keenum. But at the same time, I think there's some worry, too, that he can be a bit, and I hate to use the word, but can be a bit of a liability or at least make some risky throws at time. With with Foles, he came out and torched the Giants, which no big deal. The Giants have a horrible, horrible defense that can't even get along, especially on the back end with Landon Collins and Eli Apple. So that was expected. Uh, but then they come out and they run a very vanilla offense against Oakland. They run a very vanilla offense against Dallas. I think that was by design not to, to put too much stuff out there because the creative play calling that we saw from Peterson against the Falcons was something that we hadn't seen the last couple of weeks and something that we had grown accustomed to with Carson Wentz. We didn't know if he was going to pull it out with Foles because he didn't trust him, but he's making very he's making it very easy for Foles to identify pre-snap what needs to be done. The thing for me with Foles is he's got the worst quarterback rating out of any other quarterback that has started a game in the NFL in deep passer rating. It's 13.8. It's not good past 20 yards. They're going to have to find a way to lighten that box and scheme something. Maybe it's Nelson Aguilar, who's been one of their most productive, uh, productive deep ball receivers. But if you allow that broadcast film to become all 22 film because the safeties are able to come up within six yards of the line of scrimmage. This offense is going to have a really hard time moving the ball. And I think that's what we're going to need to see from Foles. We're going to need them. We're going to need to see a shot downfield that that's successful to loosen up the defense. Yeah. Follow up question to that. I mean, I know talking to bears Vikings fans, they really feel like, Oh, it's Nick Foles, you know, backup quarterback guy who, you know, at one time in 2013 was, you know, had a pretty historic season, but then it's kind of, um, you know, rest. What what kinds of things do you feel like he could um, do to the Vikings that you know maybe that you know the the casual fan isn't expecting that Nick Foles can do that the casual fan isn't expecting. Well, let's see. We start we started the game off with a deep bomb to Torrey Smith against the Falcons, and and all 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 week I was talking about this concept that we run early in games, especially in the first drive, where we throw that little five yard speed out from a condensed set and to Torrey Smith or Alshon Jeffrey, and I was thinking, man. I would really like to take a deep shot when it looks like that's what we're going for. And that's what we did. I would also like to see an out and up, but you saw what happened. He threw the ball like 15 yards short. And if you look at the film, there's trash being blown around on the field, right? There's a crosswind, but there was, there was also a wind to his back and the trash was all going from right to left. He was throwing right to left. So that didn't happen. So I don't know if that's necessarily something that people expect. I don't think people expect him to be as efficient as he was in the second half. Uh, against the Falcons and not making the risky decisions. He looked more like the 27 touchdown to interception falls without some of the bigger plays than he looked like the quarterback that played the Raiders and the Cowboys. So I just, I, I think from a competency standpoint, I think that's where he can surprise people. He can be efficient. He can move the ball down the field. They just got to execute. They can coach. I mean, they coached Dan Quinn out of the building. They had a driver, Dan Quinn, had to call two timeouts on defense and Brooks Reed had to go down with a quote unquote injury just to help them kind of regroup because Doug Peterson was pulling out all the tricks and Foles's ability to be on the same page with Peterson with the calls that they're making is something that will prob probably surprise people. And that's awesome. And I guess, you know, we know a lot of the big names you know, in this matchup, but I guess from your perspective, like, who are some of the, the people who could emerge as, as kind of unsung heroes that uh, that might turn this game? Like, who might be an X factor in this matchup that uh, that fans might not be thinking about right now? Uh, Danelle Ellerby is going to play a big role in run defense on early downs. He played 37 snaps against the, the Falcons. And uh, allowing him to be in the game, and this is why he is so important. He might not be the best. He's solid. Uh, but allowing him to be in the game allows... Malcolm Jenkins to play more of his traditional safety role. What we saw against the Raiders when LRB wasn't in there or hadn't emerged yet as that, as that starter, he was banged up too as well. What we saw from there was the Raiders were coming out in jumbo sets and 13 personnel. And we were coming out nickel essentially. And Malcolm Jenkins was another linebacker for us, which is insane. And Malcolm Jenkins is a very good player, very good run defender, but he's not you know, beating up a jumbo set, you know, to the run. So having to know LRB healthy, which I know he sat out or uh, was limited in practice the other day, but you know, it's the same injury. I think he's still good to go. Having him in the game is a big factor for me. The other big factor to me that, that not many people are talking about Trey Burton is extremely good in the red zone. 
And if you get him matched up on a linebacker on a safety, I think he can have a very big sneaky game. It might not be like the big seven catch, 80 yards, all that stuff, but you know, three catches for 40 yards and a key touchdown and what's probably going to be a low scoring game with not a whole lot of plays could make the difference in the game. And now we get to the moment of truth, Michael. <laughs> it's a great matchup. Vikings, Eagles, arguably the two best teams in the NFC from the start of the season. You know, the two best teams in the NFC with the best record this season. So as we do every guest from every opposing team that we have on the podcast, we need a bold prediction, something wildly outside of the box, and we need your score prediction for this game. Bold prediction, no running back for the Vikings. Get over 50 yards combined. Case Keenum throws two picks. That'll be that'll be my thing. Um, and you wanted a score prediction as well, right? Yep. So I'll go the same score that I told you on Locked On Eagles the other day when I, when I, when I had you on. I'm going to go 14-13. Eagles win two touchdowns. The Eagles aren't aren't settling for field goals when they get to the red zone. They go for it. Since Peterson has become the coach, they go for it on fourth down more than any other team in the NFL. They converted a league leading 17, uh, 17 fourth down conversions this this year and were one for one against the Falcons. They were in that beautiful goal line G lead. Peterson's gonna dial it up in the red zone. If it takes a fourth down, it's gonna get done. So 14-13 for me, I think the Eagles home defense having allowed 10, 6, and 10 points in the last three games continues along that same kind of path. Love it. There's there's that confidence that we know and love so much from that from <laughs> Hey, no one no one likes this and we don't care. That's <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, and I'm and you know, and, and I gotta respect it. I'm not gonna lie. No one likes us, we don't care, and and, and that's all right. And uh <laughs> I guess uh, you know, you know, lastly, before we get you out of here, I guess you know, you you let us know earlier where we can find some of your stuff, but I guess do you have any upcoming projects that uh that our listeners really should be aware of that you want them to check out? I just went back and looked at the week eight matchup with Alshon Jeffrey when he was with the Bears against Xavier Rhodes. I broke down that matchup pretty pretty in depth. I watched Alshon Jeffrey in the summer for Scouting Academy, and that was one of the games that I saw as well. So I had a lot, a lot of detailed notes on that. I'm going to have part two of their next matchup where Alshon didn't fare nearly as well with Matt Barkley at quarterback. I just got to find the time because it's been a whirlwind this week. All these previews and podcasts and, and all this stuff. I'll have that drop soon as well. Uh, the film room at LockdownEagles.com is awesome. Go check that out. And I'll be dropping some injury impact reports uh, some in-depth analysis of that as well leading up to the game. Well, that is awesome, man. Uh, yeah, I think we've covered everything. I guess, Yinka, did you have any other, any any final questions, any parting shots before before <laughs> Michael heads out tonight? No, we know who's going to win on uh, Sunday. <laughs> so, uh... I know, I said it, man. It's good, it's good. <laughs> well, Michael, thank you very much for coming on with us tonight, man. And uh, it sounds like you got a busy schedule, so I guess we'll let you get to it. Thank you guys for having me on. I really appreciate it. All right. Thanks, Michael. Thanks, Michael. Thank Absolutely. you, man. I guess last question for, uh, for you guys, just random question, really, I guess mostly for JR. So, like, as an offensive player going into a game like this, where, like, we watched the Falcons game and footing was terrible. Like, what kind of things? Are you adjusting your game plan at all based on the fact that, you know, in the week before – you know, the field was terrible and it's likely to be bad again this week. Do you change what you do at all? Or do you just go out there and run the same stuff and kind of hope for the best? No, I think you, the one thing you do is you take and at least three pair of cleats. So you always take a longer pair of cleats, meaning that, you know, the, <clears throat> the screws on the bottom, however, they have screw ends or plastic ends. I'm sure screw ends are actually better on a field like this because this, the footing is so bad, but I'm sure those guys have all types of different cleats and attire that they can wear throughout the week and that they practice in throughout the week to prepare for the situation. So I think you take a, a whole bunch of pair of cleats with you, no matter it's four, five, six, how many ever you need to take. And you test them all out before the game just so you can have the best footing possible because I don't think Pat Shermer is going to hold anything back in this game, and that's how you should enter this game. You shouldn't hold anything back. No matter the weather inclements, <laughs> no matter anything that happens if, in this game, there's nothing you can hold back because it's do or die. So I think Sherman should come in with a fully loaded gun, and I think he should just be ready to shoot it. I mean, this is a trip to the Super Bowl. 
the first time in what 41 years i believe it is so it's, it's a long time coming and i don't think you can hold anything back in a game like this so whatever the game plan is stick to it no matter what it is and if something does happen throughout the game that's when you do adjust depending on if it's footing or if it just comes down snowing raining whatever what Whatever may happen, that's when you do adjust in the game. But as far as coming into the game, I don't think you can hold anything back. Awesome, thank you. It's actually Prince. Have you uh, have you figured out your payday and lo- payday loan situation in case the game you know ends up being in Minnesota, so you can secure some of them uh, forty five hundred dollar Super Bowl tickets? Yeah, I mean, I work at a place where I'm pretty sure there's a few like dudes who uh, have family in the mafia and whatnot, so. Yeah, it's all taken care of, y'all. So, I mean, okay, so you, you, this you might be up. one of the few. Yeah, this might be one of the few podcasts left that I'm able to to have. But, I mean, it's been a good run, fellas. You know, we, you know we've gotten 50 plus podcasts and whatnot. So, um, go Vikings, right? Really, go <laughs> Vikings. <laughs> well, all right, gentlemen. Thank you once again for uh, for joining me. Miles is, uh, you know, he, he's upset he couldn't make it, but. As always, Miles is the world's number one puppy parent, and uh, I'm sure he'll be back for the next one. So, uh, gentlemen, thanks for hanging with me. Listeners, thank you for listening to another episode of the Climbing the Pocket podcast. We'll be back soon. Go, Mike.